And welcome again to the offices of the Game Detectives. Why is music so important to video games? Why do we constantly see top 10 lists of the best video game songs? In film, music can make or break a scene depending on how the director wants to use a composed score or a classic song. Video games operate in very much the same way. However, they have the job much harder. A film only needs to sell you on its world for 90 minutes to 2 hours, but a video game has to continually justify and invest you in the world it's created for 10, 20, 30, even more hours. It has to constantly stay fresh and unpredictable, but still feel unified and cohesive. And music is one important part in making the game feel truly cohesive. So we decided to construct a list of our top 10 video game songs. However, we had such a hard time agreeing on which songs to include that we both chose our own top five songs each. The list isn't in any way what we think are the best songs ever written for video games because that's really just too subjective. However, we would like to take time to talk about songs that we feel do something special or unique, that add enough to the video games they're in that they're worthy of standing on their own. Without any further delay, here are our top 10 video game songs. Kirby has always been a constant, and is easily one of Nintendo's most consistent franchises. They always feature the familiar pink puffball, they're always at least decent in the gameplay department, usually better than that, and always seem to have better soundtracks than should perhaps be warranted. Always bouncy, upbeat, and catchy, Kirby games can often have you humming along. Even the early days gave us songs like Gourmet Race, which has since had a seemingly infinite number of remixes. Kirby is also one of Nintendo's most experimentive franchises. They always seem to be throwing whatever idea they can make work at the Kirby wall and see what sticks. So it was inevitable that one day we would get a Kirby racing game. And with it, Checker Knights. Checker Knights is a bit of a departure in terms of Kirby music. It sounds less like a stroll through a sunny park and, and more like a Russian army storming the gates of a great castle. It goes through several sections, opening with a big brass movement and eventually to a quieter woodblock section, eventually bringing in some grandiose cymbals. No matter which part of the song you're listening to, your adrenaline is always at a high, which is key for a racing game, especially when it's utilized for the multiplayer battle mode sections. While Checker Knights isn't the most influential song in video gaming, it's certainly the most zany and bombastic, and will get you in the mood to play some video games. Platformers have a somewhat easier time making memorable music because they can just throw in sounds and instruments that sound like the level the song is designed for. For example, your ice world can include some sleigh bells, or your mountain world could include the sounds of anvils and be in theme. That means there are a lot of fun platformer songs, but most aren't memorable. It takes a unique take on a theme to really stick out. And every single level in Shovel Knight included a unique spin on the standards of that music theme. However, the best use of instrumentation goes to High Above the Land from The Flying Machine. Many games attempt to integrate objects or things from the level design into their music design. However, The Flying Machine incorporates the level design beautifully by literally starting out the piece with propellers. The initial rhythm in the piece comes from the air pockets that you hear as propellers in a helicopter go around, making it sound like the flying machine itself is making the actual music in the piece. When the melody finally does kick in, a rousing, fast-paced, and intense theme beckons you to move forward in the game. What's also brilliant about High Above the Land is the various leaps and bounds between notes in the melody that the piece utilizes, which imitates the various high-flying stunts that Shovel Knight performs in the level. Not only does High Above the Land fit the theme of an air level, but it also takes inspiration from the flying machine itself, making a theme that perfectly encapsulates what a sky level theme should be. Playing through Earthbound was not an experience I particularly enjoyed. The gameplay is dull and repetitive, the narrative was neither especially emotional nor humorous to me, and overall, it just became a slog that I dreaded playing. However, there was one aspect that always stuck out to me the music, specifically Pollyanna or Home Sweet Home. This is one of the biggest earworms in video game history, but it's more than just a catchy melody. On one level, Pollyanna fits its place as the home theme perfectly, as it just 
sounds like home. It's comforting, ethereal, and almost matriarchal, which suits the motherly themes of Earthbound. On another level, though, it perfectly addresses the more light-hearted moments of Earthbound as well as the more dreary. The lower and higher parts of the song sound like they are constantly trying to battle over the tone of the song, and neither wins. It's slow yet upbeat, it's solemn yet sweet, it's heartwarming yet depressing, not unlike the idea of home itself. I can't think of a video game song that features a better example of ambiguity and tonal dissonance. Using licensed music in video games comes with its own risks and rewards. For games like Tony Hawk Pro Skater or Grand Theft Auto, it makes sense that music from the real world would show up in these games, as part of the allure of these games is how they simulate real life experiences. Since these games are supposed to imitate real life, the original recordings of these songs can be used without taking away much from the atmosphere of the game. However, games that use licensed music in their game worlds that don't take place in the actual life on Earth run into a conundrum when using this kind of music. Either you use the original, which could possibly detract from the game world itself, or create your own cover, which again, some people could recognize and also could take away from the game's immersion. One game series that effectively uses licensed music is the Bioshock games since the series expertly toes the line between history and fantasy. Songs such as Beyond the Sea and the original Bioshock appear in their original form, because the game took place around the same time as when that song came out. However, the games also craft expert renditions of various licensed songs to great effect. The best of these is probably one of the most obscure, God Only Knows from Bioshock Infinite. Although God Only Knows was originally recorded by the Beach Boys, I honestly had no idea it was actually licensed music when I first encountered it in the game. Bioshock Infinite restructures the song to fit a barbershop quartet, a musical form popular at the turn of the century when the game takes place. Placing the song at the beginning of the game foreshadows the relationship between Booker and Elizabeth, as well as the time travel aspect of the game, since Fink was the one who founded the barbershop quartet and gave them the music that he experienced when he traveled through time. Placing the song at the end of the credits makes the player reflect on their entire journey and the importance of that song to the themes of the game. Not to mention, the four singers perfectly capture the sad and happy parts of the piece while keeping a bright tone. The harmonies hit perfectly, creating a delightful resonance between the voices. Expert performers, story foreshadowing, and thematic resonance, you can't ask for much else. In many cases, the credits are the last thing a player might see in a game. And since there's not too much that can be done or even should be done with the visuals of scrolling names, the music is left to carry the weight. Too often though, a reprise or remix of the theme or even a generic pop song is left to do all the heavy lifting. Such is not the case in Super Mario 64. Credit roll is the perfect end to an amazing adventure. The visuals and music in Super Mario 64, while extremely enjoyable, can be a bit over the top and in your face after a long journey. In the end, it's the quiet, understated tune accented by bongo drums that brings you home. Listening to the song feels like the end of an adventure, like the game is saying goodbye to you, the player. Like looking over old family vacation photos, you're treated to snapshots of the locales you visited on your journey. As the scroll continues, you get to see all the names and thank them for the gift of this larger-than-life quest. It's not just about thanking the creators, though. At the end, when you hear Mario say, Thank you so much for playing my game. Because of the music, you genuinely believe it. Openings for games tend to be either fantastic or abysmal, depending on what you play. Emphasis on an opening cutscene or cinematic appears to be more popular in previous generations, particularly the fifth generation. Nowadays, many games simply feature a main menu that takes you directly to the game without any sort of formal introduction to the game itself. While some gamers see this as a relief, as they don't have to waste any time on the same cutscene every time they start up a game, I actually really like opening scenes because it often shows me exactly what the game is attempting to do. When you make a sequel to one of the most popular games on the N64, you have to do something big to announce your game. And Super Smash Bros. Melee delivered with an amazing intro, accompanied by a fantastic opening theme. Intro, as the song is called on the sound test in the game, is an orchestral work 
that features a variety of moods, textures, and colors, while introducing a plethora of characters, all under one and a half minutes. Intro sticks out as a fantastic intro because it manages to capture the essence of many of the Nintendo games on display. The more lyrical and violin-heavy sections represent the Regal Legend of Zelda series, while the timpani solos and percussion-heavy parts stand in for intense action games like Metroid and Donkey Kong Country. The epic brass, the floating woodwinds, even the sound effects from the games on display unite to form a cohesive and exciting opening theme. Most importantly, Melee establishes itself as a worthy sequel to its predecessor by pulling out all the stops for the opening piece. It's gutsy, confident, and bold, which perfectly captures Melee's essence. Sonic the Hedgehog games have one thing you can always guarantee. Fantastic music. The games range on two very different spectrums of quality. However, even in the worst of Sonic games, they can be counted to deliver at least a memorable tune or two. Even more so than Mario or the other mascots of the time, Sonic the series is greatly defined by its music. The funky and edgy 90s Genesis beats of the 2D years, as well as the cheesy, lyricized butt rock of the 3D years, both perfectly set the tone for what Sonic's place is in the gaming world. So what era is better to tribute, the former or the latter? Studiopolis is from Sonic Mania, a game that, at the time of recording this video, has not yet come out which could make its inclusion a little contentious. However, in this case, it is less about the song itself and more about what the song represents. Sonic Mania as a game represents the ultimate move of humility on Sega's part. Its entire presentation is essentially admitting that Sega and Sonic Team no longer know how to make a quality traditional Sonic game. And rather than take another poor shot at it, it's time to outsource to people who not only know what they're doing, but passionately want to bring the blue blur back to his prime. No one is better to helm the project than fans who spent years creating their own hacks and ports of classic Sonic games. And in charge of the music is T. Lopes, a young composer known for his remixes of classic Sonic songs. Studiopolis is everything that makes Sonic great. It's funky, catchy, silly, bouncy, and pumps you up to play some fast-paced Sonic action. The tune also perfectly suits one of the most unique level concepts Sonic, or, or any other platformer for that matter, has had, a movie studio. The vocal, lights, camera action is the perfect amount of cheese. The ultimate fate of Sonic Mania may still be yet to come, but this song is already enough to know that it's clearly headed in the right direction. Okay, so it's time to go back to discussing sky levels. For some reason, lots of great music comes from worlds that feature the Big Blue. Part of that comes from the unbridled joy of flight. With no restraints holding you back, you would be free to go wherever you want, or wherever the wind takes you. That's why so many sky themes feature freewheeling woodwind runs and bold brass licks. Of course, these themes run the risk of becoming generic movie music with little to no interest beyond being fast and loud. However, when the composers use smart instrumentation, a piece can really stick out, like the Gusty Garden Galaxy from Super Mario Galaxy. The song starts out with a pretty standard brass fanfare, but the syncopated rhythm structure foreshadows the driving beat behind the music. Eventually, an oboe and violins take over the melody, but the light and persistent eighth notes on the snare drum keep the forward momentum of the piece going. As the piece goes on, more voices like low brass and other woodwinds enter into the mix, and the melody jumps even higher imitating the leaps and bounds of flight similar to how High Above the Ground does. Unlike the Shovel Knight piece, Gusty Garden Galaxy uses various dynamic levels effectively to add even more suspense and drama. And that harp solo! Modern gaming is constantly trying to blur the controversial line between films and video games. Many games like The Last of Us are able to give us cinema-level stories, but end up delivering only adequate or even less gameplay. Many games like Super Mario Galaxy are full of creative and original gameplay concepts, but don't have much, if any, story at all to tell. I will stand by the assertion that the Metal Gear Solid series is the only true transmedia experience out there, with a perfect amalgamation of thrilling unique gameplay as well as deep engrossing narratives. With that cinema level storytelling needs to come a cinema level soundtrack, and Metal Gear delivers. But when looking at the series as a whole, 
there's one song that summarizes and solidifies its place as the perfect transmedia experience. Snake Eater. The story of Metal Gear Solid 3 plays mainly as a character study on the effects of war, and the narrative fits up perfectly to that of a conventional Hollywood film, more so than any other in the franchise. So it's only fitting that the opening is almost unrecognizable to that of a film. The James Bond style opening sets up the tone of the game, as well as putting us right into the Cold War era setting. The writing and performance of the song go far beyond satire or even tribute. It could very easily be confused for an actual James Bond song. But this isn't just a catchy and memorable opening number. If you listen carefully to the lyrics, you'll find it expertly foreshadows everything to come from the perspective of the character, the boss. Repeat listens after playing the game give a much more tragic and somber tone than originally presented. Modern games are far too full of generic, orchestrated, epic-sounding songs, meant to superficially enhance the story, which by proxy ends up feeling even more generic. But Snake Eater takes a risk and lets the song itself tell the story. The Legend of Zelda games are one of the prime examples of a series that uses simple melodies to their fullest extent. After all, when so many of the games focus on playing instruments, and the systems that these games are on can only handle so much user input, you have to use as simple of themes as possible. In Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, you see a lot of melodies that are used in surprisingly complex ways, such as the Song of Storms, Zelda's Lullaby, and my personal favorite, the Bulgaro of Fire. Additionally, the background music of most areas of the world achieve much with simple themes allowed by the hardware of the N64. Almost every piece of background music exemplifies its area in the game. But none of the songs reach the perfect amalgamation of melody, harmony, rhythm, and instrumentation as the theme from Gerudo Valley. Gerudo Valley is an area you don't really visit until the last couple of hours in the game. and actually comes as quite a shock when compared to the rest of the world in Ocarina of Time. There's nothing else in the game that hints at the vast desert in the western part of the map. Likewise, the theme for Gerudo Valley features a departure from the rest of the music in the game. The intro of the piece features a Spanish guitar riff that sets the tone for the Latin-inspired melody. Eventually, trumpets and drums enter as the piece adds more harmony. However, the theme for Gerudo Valley still opts to use restraint in its composition, effectively combining a catchy melody with the superb atmospheric music used in the rest of the game. Ocarina of Time shows that less really is more when it comes to music, and that having lots of voices doesn't make a good song. Rather, the piece has to fit with the world of the game. Gerudo Valley exemplifies the type of music we need to see more of in gaming, that uses restraint effectively in order to make the world feel more fleshed out. So those are our top 10 video game songs. What are some of your favorites? What should we have added to the list? Make your case down in the comments.